So we're going to uh, reconvene, and the second hearing today is Mount Scutney Hospital. And um, Joe, besides yourself, who will be presenting uh, today? Uh, Dave Sandville, who just popped up. He's two doors down from me. Uh, and we have a, a second uh, wing person, Teresa Tabor, who is our controller, but um, would, would only be engaging if there are questions that Dave and I can't answer, but we should be swearing her in too, I believe. Sure, let's swear all three of you in together. Joanne, if you could do that. Would you all please raise your right hands, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. So, Joe, whenever you're ready, you can proceed. Okay, I will uh, bring up the slides here. And let's see how we look here. I'm going to try this and one more. Right and can uh, can you all see the slides without any difficulty? Yes, we can. Okay, then we'll move through. Um, as we just stated, it's myself, Dave, and, and Teresa. Um, for context, uh, I've now been at Manuscutney uh, for seven years, five years as the CMO, and three and a half as the CEO slash CMO uh, significant savings for the hospital to have me do both jobs. Uh, I would say it's wearing a little thin after uh, a few years, but uh, it remains the plan moving forward. Dave is still our CFO and Teresa has been our controller for a number of years as well. It's been nice to have a, a, a stable financial uh, team as well as a leadership team through the through the pandemic, managing through with new senior leaders uh, uh, would have been pretty challenging. So we'll uh, go through our overview, overview uh, the requests, provide some financial information, talk about some of the service line adjustments, uh, risks and opportunities, and then our capital budget. Uh, you've seen this before, drone view of our hospital. I like to point out our, our solar field and can't see any sheep in this picture. We still have our flock. We're not even sheep. seeing that picture. Oh, you're not? Okay, hold on. Uh, I think I know the answer here. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> How's that? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm sorry, we, we went through this yesterday and everything seemed to be working. How about anything yet? We're still on that first Mount Scutney okay. Hospital budget presentation slide. I apologize. Let it me... looks like it's working though. I don't know if there's like a circle that's in the middle that's just, maybe it's gonna take a little time. Maybe you'll have to exit out and re-enter it. Yeah, let me, um, let me do that. Okay. One that says presentation, one of those. It's not the first one, it might be the second. I can't see it with my glasses. How about this? We're back at that main uh, okay. beginning slide. Yep. There you go. Now we're okay. on to the slide that mentions your names. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do it this way. I was trying to be slick. I'm sorry. Um, there's our overhead view. We'll move right through. Our mission is to improve the lives of those we serve. This is one of our, our recent uh, rehab patients. Um, I, I did want to make a note that we uh, uh, completed a, a new strategic plan in the beginning of uh, 2020, and I'd be happy to share that uh, with the board um, uh, offline or in a separate uh, document in general that adopted um, more of our Dartmouth Hitchcock Health System related themes. Um, and it was significant reworking that took about a year or so. Uh, so I will share I will I will share that with the board uh, post presentation. Our organizational chart of where we 
uh, stand within Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. You can see us right in the middle here, Windsor Hospital Corporation, that's us, Montescotney Hospital and Health Center. And I'd make another quick note around the historic homes of Runnymede. That is our assisted living facility in the downtown Windsor. Um, it's been of a bit of a grand experiment over the last five years as we've uh, moved to have a greater population of Medicaid extended care patients uh, there and actually taking a sicker cohort of those Medicaid patients that require waivers from the state. I would say while it is a uh, an ALF, uh, we run it uh, in, in a way that there are a number of folks there that, that could potentially also uh, benefit from nursing home care, but because we've got the nursing staff and the waivers in place, we're trying to provide that. And it's a, yeah, uh, by a significant amount, the lowest cost assisted living facility in the, in, in the region. Uh, it's been a struggle, uh, uh, but we've been able to keep our heads above water there. Uh, in, uh, as we move through the sub layers of, of questions, we were asked to comment on our uh, integration activities with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. Um, as I've said for the last couple of years, there have been, uh, there's ever increasing momentum uh, to become, uh, to have a more mature health system. Of all the things that I've bulleted up on this slide, um, there are varying levels of engagement and, and overlap uh, in, in the services, both administrative and clinical. For example, our regional lab services are 100% integrated with Dartmouth-Hitchcock, our telemedicine and telepsychiatry services in both our ED and on the inpatient units are fully integrated with Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Our radiology service is fully uh, uh, integrated. That's just on the clinical side and above pharmacy, compliance, quality, um, uh, growing shared services. Uh, again, have, we've made significant progress in the last few years uh, around integration. And please stop me if there are um, uh, any questions on the content and the slides that, that we're sharing. Uh, ongoing uh, activities, uh, both integrated and, and otherwise, uh, we've made some uh, significant changes in our uh, primary care practice management. These, this is a, these are hospital-owned practices. We, we are not affiliated with an FQHC. Um, we had an operational goal in 2020 to add 1,000 patients to our primary care practices for a whole host of reasons, the pandemic being one of them. Uh, we were not able to meet that goal. We probably added a couple hundred patients uh, to our practice over, over 2020 so far. Um, we, we suffer in our clinics around our, uh, around our staffing model and uh, primary care has uh, become much more of a part-time practice as opposed to a full-time practice for in a number of our physicians. Uh, so the, the numbers I'll, I'll share, you know, we, we have about 11 primary care providers uh, for somewhere between six and 7,000 uh, outpatients in our primary care clinics in Windsor. Uh, of those 11 providers, it's about seven FTE. So you get the sense of a lot of providers, most of them part-time, not a huge patient population. It, creates some stress on our, our clinic operations. We certainly don't have economies of, of scale. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work around uh, quality and patient safety. I like to brag that we've got the highest quality and safety uh, overall metrics in the health system, the highest employee engagement uh, in the health system. And uh, as of uh, you know, a, a report in uh, Becker's, we already knew about this a couple days ago, we're only one of two hospitals uh, in Vermont to have the five-star rating from CMS for our HCAP survey. So that's a representative a representation of our inpatient satisfaction surveys for their inpatient experience at Manuscutney. So we're uh, starting to trumpet that uh, a little bit more, more widely. Uh, I think you've heard us say this before, we have a strong history of, of, of aggressive expense management here, uh, pretty lean operation. 
Uh, we'll certainly be completing our fiscal year 20 with uh, uh, significantly under budget uh, from an FTE perspective. And and uh, again, and this is a uh, the only maybe the only upside of managing through a pandemic is our overall expenses are down significantly for FY20 as well. And remain, we remain committed at the senior leadership level of of pulling every new position or potential hire into our position control process to make sure that we we really need it and that every FTE continues to be accounted for. Our current service lines um, have uh, not changed uh, significantly from last year, except for the addition of urology. Everything you see in a red font uh, is uh, has at least a provider, a single provider, or, or at least uh, part of an FTE coming down from Dartmouth Hitchcock in Lebanon. So we have a cardiologist a day of week, a day a week uh, from DH. We have all of our pathology and lab services are run through Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. As I mentioned before, our radiology program is entirely integrated. Um, we have a GI provider a day a week, a general surgery provider three days a week from DH, a pain management provider a day and a half a week. Urology is new. Um, this was a provider that uh, wanted to leave a neighboring facility. Uh, she was a DH provider. DH reached out to us uh, to see whether we could uh, accommodate uh, a new surgical specialist. Uh, she came on board in the beginning of 2020, and then we had our pen. Then the pandemic started, so we. It, it's been a challenge to see how that new practice uh, will actually work for us and work for the region. Uh, hopefully, as the dust settles, we'll have a better idea. Uh, we have telehealth uh, in our emergency in, in our emergency room, uh, as well as telepsychiatry service for both the emergency room. Uh, and in our inpatient units. And then as always, we have our community health teams, which are uh, uh, robust. Uh, uh, moving through, uh, we were asked to comment on our initial ongoing and uh, projected uh, impact and response to COVID-19. Um, year to date through February, we were largely on budget or a bit or slightly better, um, but then we quickly shut everything down uh, we uh, continue to be an incident command, so that is about five and a half months of incident command uh, at the ad administrative and, and leadership level. Our initial focus was really on patient and employee safety um, and maintaining uh, access for urgent and emergent services. So that uh, involved ensuring our supply chain for PPE. Great benefit of being part of the larger system in that we we reply. Uh, we uh, rely wholly on Dartmouth Hitchcock Health for our PPE supply chain, and they've they've done a nice job. We haven't suffered any shortages. Uh, we had to do some very quick facility modification, new temporary walls, plexiglass everywhere, protection of our door screeners and staff. Uh, the thing uh, I'm most proud of is the early establishment of a respiratory clinic. Um, at our, at our main entrance uh, where we screen and segregate uh, uh, patients uh, that are having respiratory symptoms or concern for COVID exposure uh, immediately and they're sent to a different part of the hospital with a distinct group of providers and nurses that, that care for them. We've been able to keep somewhere between 30 and 50 uh, outpatients uh, who eventually tested uh, uh, positive out of the general hospital population and waiting rooms by getting that respiratory clinic up within about, I want to say, seven or eight days of, of when we shut things down. Um, we, uh, you know, we had to deal with uh, uh, low volume and again with, with our eye on expense management. Um, our, our nursing staff, in the best of times, non-pandemic, uh, they run a very tight ship uh, with call-offs for low census or low volumes. Uh, we moved a bunch of people uh, uh, off-site uh, to work remotely. Uh, that has continued, although the number of folks coming back is increasing. We had to door screen, and I'm probably hitting bullets that you've heard in every budget presentation so far, so I won't um, 
uh, spend too much time on it. Um, but it's it was challenging. It was tiring. Um, we haven't had a single employee uh, test positive uh, for COVID, uh, so that that's been a great uh, success. Um, and hopefully that that continues with our screening. The second phase of the COVID impact in in response was again, uh, you know, adjusting to changing standards and uh, what the, what PPE standards are were, what they are now, what they are likely to be. There's been a lot of adjustment for our providers, our care providers, respiratory therapy, nursing, uh, physicians, associate providers. But they've had to adjust uh, to working with a, uh, a face shield and a mask all the time with every patient uh, interaction. We uh, Our role in the system was to continue to care for a large number of Dartmouth-Hitchcock post-acute patients, and that included the COVID patients. Um, we were the only uh, swing unit uh, accepting uh, COVID patients during the pandemic. Um, it may have lightened up, or the restrictions on, at other places may have lightened up, but we built out a separate negative pressure wing off our, uh, off our usual uh, hospital unit where we were taking um, COVID uh, patients post-acute after long and complex ICU stays. And our, our staff really uh, stepped up to the challenge there. Um, but it's an, it's an everyday battle. Um, uh, the return to schools has created new stress around our workforce um, as every school district seems to have taken on a different tact uh, as far as hybrid learning, uh, a mixture of remote, in-person, some going all remote, some going all in-person. Uh, so now we're gonna have to respond to that. And we are actively serving uh, our director of quality and safety and our pediatricians are working with our surrounding school districts uh, on their reopening task force. So we, we've taken a large role in the in the schools and we'll continue to do so um, on the, as I mentioned on the next slide here, um, what I didn't put it, uh, I didn't put a bull on here, but I should have. But as we move toward the flu season, early and aggressive vaccination is really going to be the big push from a public health standpoint, hopefully in all communities. But we are now aggressively working with the state and the schools so that we can uh, do what New Hampshire does, which is do all their uh, pediatric flu vaccinations in, in, in the schools during flu season. We, uh, it is. Uh, a big change in operations, and uh, we're going to need some wiggle room within the regulatory and, and environment around immunization so that we can actually pull this off. But I think it's a, uh, I think it's an imperative. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is um, at the DHH system level, uh, early in the pandemic, we all the system members made a commitment to not uh, pursue furloughs or layoffs. Uh, we've been able to main uh, maintain that. Um, so it was uh, a time to recommit to our employees uh, that I think has been um, pretty well received, although I think most employees at all of the all of our hospitals are getting pretty tired of, of life in, in, in COVID um, at this point. So at this point, I'll pause for any questions on the first uh, 12 slides and then I will hand off to Dave for the next few to talk about uh, some of the financial impact uh, of COVID and, and what we've had to do. Joe, if it's okay, okay with you, the, the way that we always do it is hold all the uh, questions till after the presentation. Got is it. Fine. Sounds good. Perfect. Thanks. So uh, Dave, I'll keep my presentation up and you just tell me uh, to advance as needed. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good to be here. Um, so, uh, talking a little bit about the financial impact of uh, you know our COVID response and, and the pandemic in general. So, net revenue to date is running about five million dollars behind uh, normal. If we remove what was uh, done through February and just look at March uh, through current, uh, our net revenue was actually down $7 million. So COVID specific, we've taken essentially a $7 million haircut on, on net patient service revenue. And uh, so, you know, I know we've uh, we've applied for everything we could get 
to be honest with you. We got about $5 million in stimulus funds, which were great. Um, we got about one third of what we uh, should have gotten on the Medicare advanced payment funding. Uh, we're trying to get as much funding uh, from FEMA, SHIP, FLEX, and, and all the other sources that we can. Um, uh, kind of the, uh, just like uh, our other patients uh, were not coming into our facility during this time, um, well, guess what? Our, our employees weren't going out and getting a lot of services either. So uh, we actually got a little bit of a, a benefit on our benefits cost. Um, kind of an unexpected issue that came up uh, that has affected our, um, our finances is we had a lot of folks who came in uh, post-acute, stayed for a swing bed stay, you know, sniff level, kicked down to ICF level. And because of all of the uh, uh, facilities and locations we would typically discharge these people to being locked down, uh, we've had to maintain uh, what we call borders here. And um, we've got seven or eight as I sit here today. Um, and we've got a reserve built on that because there's no, there's no reimbursement for those folks. Um, and uh, the reserve that we're carrying on our receivable right now is about seven hundred thousand dollars, so it's 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 fairly material. Um, we've worked very aggressively with the ombudsman and um, the Medicaid programs and the local facilities and trying to come up with uh, creative solutions for some of these folks. But uh, to be frank, uh, uh, nobody's really been able to uh, to. Uh, accept these patients. Even we have some that probably uh, could go home, but there's no family support given the circumstances. So um, we've got uh, seven or eight uh, residing in our unit. Um, financial decisions, Joe referenced, we uh, did not do a layoff or furlough. Uh, we reallocated uh, employees. Uh, we did exercise call off, low census, encouraged ETO usage. Um, so that kind of took the edge off um, some of our staffing. Uh, we've really uh, managed all of our open positions, so I won't say we have a hiring freeze, but we've been uh, incredibly selective on the positions that we've posted and, and tried to uh, uh, fill. Uh, we, we were scheduled to do some raises this year and to make some uh, retirement contributions based on budget. Um, those have been postponed indefinitely, uh, given the circumstances, and uh, we we have only done the capital that was in process when COVID hit, uh, emergency replacement of equipment that uh, we feel put us or patients at risk, and capital that uh, would be beneficial to manage through the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so how did this impact our budget? Um, you know, we're working through recovery. We did a few different iterations of the budget, um, probably at least three full uh, efforts to put a budget forward as uh, things changed. Um, if I were to assign a number uh, of, you know, how close to normal uh, volume wise are we for, for budget 21, uh, I would say somewhere around 94, 95% things that are, are emergent, urgent, or absolutely medically necessary, which is most of our inpatient business, um, infusion for chemotherapy and, and, and things like that. Those are, we're expecting uh, that those are gonna stay pretty close to 100% of normal. Uh, the more we move down the scale of things that are elective or preventative, where patients do have choices to push off certain services, uh, we're expecting that to be more like about 90%. Um, we're, we're keeping uh, tight staffing. Uh, we've definitely added uh, um, some positions to facilitate our recovery and uh, execution of safe care and uh, for our patients and for our employees. Most notably is door screeners. You know, we're the classic old Vermont farmhouse. We've got a bunch of different entrances and uh, um, it, we've really looked at how we can consolidate that to the fewest number of entrances and still not uh, grossly inconvenience our patients. Uh, but that uh, is, is going to be probably somewhere between uh, seven and 10 FTEs um, that will be added uh, ongoing. 
And so we've tried to look at all of our other positions, open or otherwise, and, and tried to limit those uh, going forward. Yesterday, for uh, we had a very uh, detailed discussion in what we call position control uh, and uh, try to figure out, you know, how can we integrate uh, the screening staff with some other people that we would normally staff and, and move them around and, and try to uh, develop some efficiencies. We may have found a couple FTEs worth of uh, uh, improvement on that total, but I, I don't know that we're going to be able to do much more than that. Um, we're expecting, um, you know, this flattened curve to last through most, if not all, of FY21. We have budgeted no raises. Um, thankfully, um, our benefits have been running pretty good for, for a number of years now, uh, and so we expect it to be essentially flat. And uh, we have what we call limited retirement uh, budgeted. And there's actually kind of two drivers on that. Uh, one is with the termination of our pension plan this year, uh, there's some, we had a very favorable termination. And so we actually had 50 or $100,000 left of uh, left over after everybody got bought out. And uh, if I don't give a retirement contribution this year through 403B, then I send uh, half of that money uh, to the federal government. So I would uh, much rather give our employees the $100,000. And uh, additionally, uh, Dartmouth has, has uh, told us that they, as a system, want to make sure that uh, while we've had to tinker with people's income and whatnot for the last several months, um, that we should be committed to doing retirement. So we're expecting to do about uh, 2% of eligible uh, employees' uh, salaries. Uh, obviously, volume's changing by the week. We track this uh, daily, weekly, our efforts to recover, and we try to throw some time and effort at uh, managing some of the departments that are lagging behind uh, in recovery. And uh, as Joe referenced earlier, you know, best practice seems to change just about weekly. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll talk about this later in, in, in some of the other financial slides, but um, essentially uh, we've asked for a 4.3% blended rate for the year. Uh, 2.1 would be what I would call normal and gets us to the 3.5% growth. And 2.2 is to manage the effects of COVID uh, for this year relative to cash and, and next year going forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, you guys are good readers, so uh, I don't plan on talking about these other than to highlight uh, our operating margin for, for 21 will be $351,000. Our total margin will be 1.1 million, uh, and that's a, about a half a percent operating margin for operations and uh, almost a 2% margin for total margin. Uh, balance sheet uh, cash is uh, definitely take, um, I'm sorry, this is cash flow. Um, you know, we're, we're expecting uh, to lose a position in cash uh, over the course of this year um, for any of the number of reasons you've probably already heard, uh, decreased volume, uh, decreased um, uh, net revenues, and uh, and hoping to bend that that uh, degradation with reduced capital spending and uh, some expense management. Uh, next slide, Joe. And then uh, kind of a, a balance sheet. Uh, the takeaways really are that um, you know we've lost some value in our receivable. It's starting to come back now. Um, you know, cash has definitely gone down about 2.7 million from our last. Uh, fiscal year end to where we are today. We expect that to improve a bit. And uh, our liabilities change radically with uh, buying out our, our pension. Uh, but that also resulted us in taking on some long-term debt that uh, Dartmouth was, uh, was willing to afford us with some very positive uh, interest rates. Next slide. So again, uh, total volume, if I were a signed number, approximately 94, 95% of normal. Uh, for our budget next year, a 4.3% blended rate, 6% for uh, most of the hospital departments, 0% uh, on pharmacy, and 3% uh, for our clinics and, and provider billing. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, 2.1% blended 
gets us to uh, a three and a half MPSR growth uh, budget to budget. And uh, the 2.2% that we assigned to COVID, um, really covering supplies, equipment, some replenishment of cash, and uh, the concern about capital funding. And because we've pushed off so much capital funding this year, um, you know, we were kind of just getting to a place where capital was kind of a normal and routine reinvestment year to year, and we didn't feel like we had a lot of pressure for failing equipment or mechanicals and things like that. And so, um, you know, we're a little bit concerned going forward that we've kicked a couple key facility uh, capital pro uh, projects this year down the road, but uh, we'll see how that turns out. Next slide. Our payer mix is essentially the same. Um, you know, we've kind of had to make a lot of determination in, in, in not only managing this year's financials or the budget, but uh, looking at some other things as well as, you know, how much do we count our COVID experience going forward? How much do we discount it? And uh, um, so essentially we've, we've proposed a, a very similar payer mix um, going forward as we had prior to COVID. Um, some of our more fragile patients are found in the Medicare and, and Medicaid programs. And so those volumes went down uh, during COVID as a percent of business, um, they, which made Blue Cross and commercial seem bigger, but in fact, that was uh, still less than normal as far as revenues went. Uh, we have seen a, a, a change between Blue Cross Blue Shield, meaning New Hampshire, Vermont, and out of state, and an all other commercial. Um, that's. I don't know that it's really material on our bottom line, but it, it was just kind of curious that uh, some of the policies and plans, uh, there seems to be some movement within that. Um, re changes in reimbursement by payer. Um, we did get a clean PSNR uh, at the very end of June. Uh, we immediately filed our FY19 cost report within a week. Uh, and uh, but we did not have enough time to uh, re run our interim year to date uh, to change our budget. So we've taken really no risk or, or uh, uh, you know, on that projecting it into next year. Um, you know, as a critical assets hospital, our fixed expenses are arguably 70 to 80 percent uh, of our total expenses. And with units going down during this COVID period, in theory, um, you know, you would you would garner more cost per unit uh, in the in the Medicare cost report settlement. Uh, unfortunately, we lost a lot of Medicare business as a percentage, so Medicare will um, you know share in less of that increase in cost per unit. So we really need to do a, a full blown uh, interim cost report, not only to close this year, but uh, also to have a better handle on on how uh, we can expect all of this to roll through in 21. Um, Medicaid moving from this year to next year, projected 20 to uh, budget 21, is actually going to improve as far as a reimbursement percentage, mainly because uh, we, we're, we're hoping and expecting not to have uh, seven or eight borders in for uh, six, seven, eight months. I mean, some of these borders were here before COVID hit, and some of them have come in during this time uh, but they are a huge uh, material hit on our net revenue for Medicaid. So uh, we're keeping a positive attitude and, and, and hoping to find some creative ways to place them uh, in the next few months. And commercial is largely uh, uh, an immaterial change budget to budget. Next slide, Joe. Uh, deductions. So uh, again, we didn't have an interim cost report to really evaluate our current uh, reimbursement experience with Medicare year to date. Uh, to be frank, I'm not even sure really how much value that would have given uh, that we had some departments that are high cost departments that were down uh, 50 or 55 percent in volumes uh, and high Medicare. So again, uh, we took no risk. We didn't really take a gain. We really didn't take a loss. We just kind of uh, took the same percentage and applied it going forward. Um, our budget only represents a, a first quarter participation of One Care Vermont Medicare uh, because that's a calendar year contract. Uh, we do have a full year of uh, One Care Vermont Medicaid, uh, including the risk reserves and whatnot built into our uh, budget. Uh, we do not have any commercial participation 
uh, listed for those uh, last nine months of FY21. Our payer mix, we're not expecting big changes and there were no material changes in bad debt or free care as a percentage of gross uh, patient service revenue. Um, other operating revenue, you know, there's been some questions about whether Blueprint funding will continue in its current form going forward, and if so, how much. Um, having no specific uh, um, uh, information or final information on that, um, we estimated a 50% reduction from our current levels. Um, 340B income will remain essentially flat. There'll be some inflationary increases. Uh, we do have a material increase with the PNG grant uh, that was came from the feds through uh, the state of Vermont and extended to um, uh, to uh, Mount Escutney. And uh, that grant is about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And essentially, it's 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 an offset between expenses and other operating, uh, uh, pretty much dollar for dollar. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, staff sharing um, uh, is increasing. What is staff sharing? Um, as we've kind of worked through some regional things here and are starting to uh, uh, develop some partnerships with other providers in the area, uh, we've began to uh, rent staff and, and it, you know, this originally said staff renting, uh, which really is inappropriate, but uh, we didn't really have a better uh, term. So I believe that Joe uh, wordsmith this and said staff sharing. So uh, we are sharing, we are, we are renting uh, a couple uh, small percentages of FTEs from other places, and we are also renting some folks out and uh, that is increasing. And that's both staff and providers. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, other operating uh, revenue, uh, non-operating revenue rather, uh, if we're expecting 5% returns uh, and uh, we have kind of an annual placeholder of $250,000 uh, of fundraising. Um, that uh, may be challenging. Um, we, were, we lost our uh, director of development. Uh, he passed away a few months ago and so we're still trying to figure out how we're going to uh, um, work those development uh, plans that were in place uh, and part of our strategic plan going forward, but uh, we left the placeholder for the moment. Next slide, please. And so uh, kind of getting through the expenses as quickly as possible. So our FTEs are essentially flat. They're up uh, three quarters of an FTE. And that is uh, despite uh, some expansion of ophthalmology and psychiatry, which Joe will talk about later. Um, new services of urology, which we uh, implemented this fiscal year, uh, and also um, a 0.6 neurology uh, service that uh, Joe will also talk about later. Um, but those were, you know, even though the, those were gains, we had a lot of reductions because of the expected volume uh, decrease uh, currently and going into next year. And then we added back uh, COVID related FTEs, which as I mentioned earlier, will be somewhere between seven and 10 FTEs uh, once we figure it out. Um, purchase labors up budget to budget. Part of that is the contracted DH urologist and the rest is travelers. We've done very well uh, over the last few years with minimizing travelers, uh, but that seems to be a, a, a growing concern here at Mount Escutney. And so we took our current uh, level of travelers and projected that into 21. Um, again, benefits are flat. And we talked about the retirement contribution and the termination of uh, the pension. Um, so I won't belabor that point. Um, if you look at the comparatives uh, on the uh, five or so sheets, analysis sheets that you guys are, are uh, looking at, uh, you'll see there's a large movement uh, between uh, uh, purchase labor and other operating expenses. And so there was a change in reporting there. And, uh, you know, nearly $5 million of that is just a reporting change from one category to another. So, you know, medical, surgical, drugs and supplies. So again, because of COVID, everything's goofy. Um, you know, well, supplies are going down because volume's going down, but then we're buying COVID supplies that we never bought. So that increases it. Uh, we also had some, uh, um, you know, other supplies for the new service urology. 
which included uh, pharmaceuticals as well, some of the procedures that she's performing here. Uh, inflation is kind of all over the board. Um, you know, some things are, are have become more expensive because because of freight and just normal inflation. Um, as with any other crisis, um, some manufacturers and vendors uh, take an opportunity to uh, bounce up uh, their pricing. Um, and we don't have a lot of leverage on them, especially at this particular time. Uh, additionally, as you, I'm sure you've heard elsewhere already, um, you know, there's that ongoing uh, increase in standard of care for infusion, chemotherapy, and otherwise. Um, and we're, it, there's, you know, it, it's impossible for us to order, uh, offer anything less than best practice. And, and so uh, it's not even just inflation on the pharmaceuticals, it's, it's the upgrades to more expensive medications. Uh, provider tax is essentially flat. Depreciation is going up a bit, uh, mainly because of the age of the uh, uh, capital that we expect to be doing next year. Interest is up significantly uh, due to the pension loan. Um, when we did the analysis of this, you know, approximately a year ago as to whether we were going to be able to do it and whether it would be a good time in the market to do it, uh, the internal rate of return for this transaction was uh, 9%. So it was it was as close to a no brainer um, as as we could get. And and Dartmouth, because they've been working as a system to try to reduce the exposure and risk associated with the pension, um, you know, they they were they they realized that uh, offering us a low interest loan, which was very small to them but very large to us, uh, was in the system's best interest. Our employees um, are, are completely secure and taken care of, um, and uh, the market uh, minimized our expense to, to get uh, out of it. And so I think it's a win-win as far as the state uh, goes as we look at this. Um, you know, we've, we've cut down uh, a lot of expense risk going forward, and we've uh, shaved off a couple hundred thousand dollars a year guaranteed expense going forward. Uh, in the benefits section. So I think every, this is a win-win-win for everybody. Uh, other operating expenses, so uh, there was the removal of uh, purchase labor that I mentioned earlier, and, and that was assigned into the salary fringe and physician cost line. Uh, utilities were reduced, purchase services were increased, uh, equipment rental, some service contracts. Um, uh, the other thing that's not listed on there uh, was the uh, the PNG grant, again, about $450,000 of that increase uh, was related specifically to that grant because most of what we're doing to fulfill that grant for the state are contracted services uh, with other organizations or individuals or consultants to help facilitate um, the execution of that grant. Next slide, Joe. Um, so the change in charge, we've kind of talked about this. Um, you can see the uh, the, the, the changes uh, in gross charges are, are higher on the hospital, lower uh, uh, for the providers and uh, essentially zero for the drugs. Um, and basically what we're doing there is with the drugs is we, we mark up on actual cost. So we don't inflate uh, the gain on that markup year to year. Um, so we just that that's we felt like the most fair way with the medication of pharmaceutical expenses and uh, and the changes in them is uh, to make sure that we're being consistent in our markup with that and being consistent with uh, what gets pushed to the payers and ultimately to the employers and patients. Next slide, please. Uh, just some quick financial history. If you want to look at this. I always like to look at things quick, kind of quick and dirty. What do I see? And kind of really from 2013 to 2021, uh, you know, we're basically uh, uh, trending slightly up, uh, a little bit better than break even. If you look at 2008 to 2012, those are the dark years. Uh, they were horrible. Uh, and um, uh, prior to that, kind of uh, uh, a little bit better than break even. And I always like to look at this cumulatively, and if Joe would flip to the next slide. So the, the orange line is kind of what we had budgeted to do historically from 2000 uh, till now. 
Uh, and uh, the blue line is how we have performed cumulatively uh, since 2000. And, and again, if you look at 2012, which was the, the horrendous year for, for Maniscotny, uh, it's when Joe and I got here, not that we did that, but we got here later in the year. So uh, before Joe, before Dave, um, you know, we've kind of been break even and, and trending slightly up. So I think I, I don't think it's a great story from a business uh, uh, perspective and, and managing to margins. But I think with all of the change and the environmental issues that we've all had to deal with over the last several years, this is probably a pretty good story for a small CAH. Next slide, please. Great. And I'll, I'll take over uh, here on this slide. This is for our service line adjustments. Um, I already mentioned our urology. Uh, new urologist uh, that we have. Uh, she is uh, 0.6 with us, uh, 0.6 FTE, three days uh, a week. Uh, she is not a new provider to the larger health system. Um, we had, because we hadn't had a urology practice previously, we had a significant investment uh, in new equipment uh, to bring her on board. Um, yeah, this is what we are um, uh, projecting for new NPSR uh, with this new urology practice. That said, the, uh, the pandemic has uh, significantly set back uh, our plans uh, for growing that practice and, and actually trying to keep her busy. Uh, neurology is a, uh, a new service that I have been clamoring for for as long as I've been at Mount Escutney, we are a, a rehab hospital. There's only two acute rehab hospitals in Vermont, us and uh, UVM. Uh, and we, uh, the vast majority of the cases of the patients on our acute rehabilitation unit are neurology patients, post-stroke, post-spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury from uh, you know multiple traumas or MVAs. Um, we finally uh, uh, identified a candidate in conjunction with DH, a graduating fellow in neurology from, from Dartmouth-Hitchcock that would serve both Mount Escutney Hospital and the VA. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of new administrative pressures at the federal level, it has been incredibly challenging uh, to get this uh, woman, the, the H-1B uh, uh, visa that she needs uh, to continue uh, working in in Vermont. Uh, so we were I was reluctant to put the neurology service on our service line slide earlier in the talk, but we've had some good news this week that uh, the we've had uh, approval at the federal level and we're hoping that we will have this neurologist who will be about a 0.6 FTE at Maniscutney serving outpatient inpatient. Um, uh, starting, we're hoping, mid to late September at the latest. In ophthalmology, uh, we are uh, uh, the only uh, non-DH ophthalmology service really in our communities uh, for surgical ophthalmology, specifically cataracts. That is the vast majority of, of operative cases that our ophthalmology service performs. We have um, uh, two providers that are closer to the end of their career than the beginning of their uh, careers and have started to plan for succession as they inevitably slow down their practice uh, over the next five years. And we are actively recruiting for another optometrist and, and uh, hopefully we'll have some success there. Uh, in psychiatry, I think this is a real success story for us. We uh, uh, hired a, a 1.0 psychiatrist earlier this year during the pandemic uh, in addition who's in addition to the 0 0.8 0 0.9 FTE psychiatrist that we already have and we just uh, sent a, a, a employment contract to another psychiatrist who is leaving the uh, New York City area and uh, moving back to a family house with his family in uh, in Woodstock so we will have a, a growing psychiatry program, which is much needed uh, in our region, and I think would certainly qualify as a essential 
service. Uh, we've uh, stopped talking about having a psychiatrist and now stopped started describing it as actually having a psychiatry program uh, with three psychiatrists, a social worker, uh, licensed counselor, and dedicated nursing. Um, this is all outpatient. They will certainly help provide inpatient consultation and work in our EDs. We are, we are not planning on building uh, inpatient uh, psychiatry unit. This is purely to meet the community need, both in Windsor, um, areas of, of, of Springfield as well, uh, across the river, over in Claremont, uh, communities that are in uh, in significant need of, of uh, behavioral health resources. Uh, Dave, do you want to take service line adjustments for one slide here? Yes, so the, uh, we were asked to provide some uh, kind of oversight on, on what our expectations are for, for those two uh, brand new services. And um, essentially, you know, it was really hard to estimate because uh, urology started uh, two, it was two months into a new practice when uh, COVID hit. And uh, so, you know, those are kind of sketchy numbers looking forward. And additionally, we've had zero neurology. So uh, we were able to estimate the clinics, but when uh, you start getting into what is the neurologist ordering for ancillaries, and uh, we were a little bit more dependent upon external sources of data. Um, but essentially, uh, uh, both practices uh, will functionally lose money, which is uh, probably no big surprise to you folks. Uh, uh, there, there are very few um, hospital-owned practices that, that within the, the, the actual practice itself are, are positive. Um, however, um, the ancillaries, and in the case of urology surgery and ancillaries uh, that we expect to garner uh, from their presence, uh, will push both of those uh, into a positive margin if you were to think about it holistically. Um, one is a uh, 1.2 increase budget to budget for FTEs, and the other is a 2.2 increase in FTEs year to year. And I'll take the next few. Um, you know, with our, our risks moving forward, as they always are, you know, we're, we're a, a small, we have small practices. Uh, uh, and as, as Dave has mentioned previously, when you make small changes with uh, contracting risk or otherwise, you have big, you can have big variances. And, uh, and then we, you know, we're also looking for uh, succession planning around various uh, service lines that have, we've historically been quite strong in with ophthalmology being uh, one of them. When you lose a provider um, at a small place, it, the ripple effect is substantial. Uh, we have a, we have, Continuing questions, as everyone else does, of, of, of how long we'll be with, with COVID. My medical and public health opinion is we'll be reporting on how the dust has settled at this time next year for next year's budget. Um, I think we'll be fully reliant upon a vaccine. Um, as you know, the upside of, of living up here is our community prevalence rate is so low. The downside is we'll never have herd immunity, so we're going to be really dependent upon a vaccine, um, and we'll continue to be dealing with the costs and, and lost opportunities in our practices uh, through through COVID, and the concern that patients are not not coming in for the care uh, that they need. We've been really aggressive in reaching out to our communities, direct mailings, emailing them, social media ads, and local papers uh, describing our safety workflows and protocols to to get patients back in the door uh, we very quickly built out telehealth services and at one point got up to about 40 to 50 percent of our outpatient visits were telehealth um, not a huge satisfier for either our patient population or our providers and we're back down to probably about five six percent uh, of overall visits in primary care being uh, 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 telehealth delivered for ACO engagement, I'm sure we'll talk uh, more about this. At the time of our budget submission, we did not have 2019 performance data or the risk orders that we would expect to see in 2021. Uh, we certainly did not have a board of trustees who was uh, uh, who were willing to uh, support uh, the same footprint in 21 that we've had in 20. So we chose a conservative path in our budget submission. 
we will be presenting all of the options for 21 uh, for One Care to our board of trustees and to DHH leadership, functionally my boss, on 9-7 during a special board meeting, and we'll finalize our contracting with One Care on 9-11 based on uh, those discussions. And I believe that is the um, uh, deadline for contract submission uh, with One Care. We've prepared a lot of data for both our board, for DHH leadership, and for our own good regarding our what, what our total cost of engagement is uh, with One Care. And uh, as I said, I'm sure this will come up with uh, questions after we finish our presentation. Ongoing risks are recruiting and retention, both provider and, and, and staff, wage pressures um, that continue to increase. Uh, we have real risk in our anesthesia staff as our providers are aging. And um, it is an increasingly expensive service to provide internally. You can see why a number of hospitals contract with third parties to provide their anesthesia care. Um, it, it is also tough being uh, a border hospital uh, when virtually every person that we recruit, whether it's a secretary or a doctor, is asking us what premium we're going to give them because they have to now pay Vermont income taxes, whereas right over the Connecticut River, they do not. Uh, Dave has already mentioned the inflation around pharmaceuticals. Um, you know that we've really built this culture of quality and patient safety, and that requires a significant amount of investment, uh, best practice training, equipment, how we do things. Um, we, we say this every year, there's an increased dependence on other operating income, such as 340B. And then we've already uh, emphasized our the issues that we've had, especially during the pandemic around dis, uh, discharge and, and placement pressures. One note uh, I did want to uh, uh, put uh, out there for maybe discussion later or follow up offline is um, we, uh, as we start to uh, move into uh, responding to the uh, uh, sustainability questions uh, after the budget season here. Um, you know, we've really tried to focus on essential services for our communities. We don't have neurosurgery or orthopedics or uh, other lower volume, high reimbursement service lines. Um, but we have found even within our own health system and in our neighboring hospitals that the folks that do have that uh, have a you know a little bit healthier bottom line, which then translates to higher wages for LNAs, certified medical assistants, uh, mid-level providers, associate providers. Um, so it's something I think we're all going to have to keep in mind as a statewide health system that as we focus on essential services, we don't want to get into a situation of winners and losers, and the winners who get all the surgical services are able to pay their staff better. And I'll say it's a real concern of mine because we are we are certainly living it. We've lost some staff this week due to uh, pay discrepancies across the region. And that's despite having, like I said earlier, very high quality and safety metrics, the highest employee engagement really in, in the 85th percentile nationally around employee engagement. But at the end of the day, if it's a buck or two an hour when you're lower end of the pay scale, folks are going to make that jump. So uh, uh, as far as opportunities go, uh, we continue with uh, regional planning, three critical access hospitals within 20 miles of each other. It is unclear at this point from my perspective if, if, if Springfield Hospital will be a partner or a competitor in our region. Uh, that's a just an, an, an honest assessment. We are working very closely with Valley Regional Healthcare in Claremont, New Hampshire. We're starting to uh, talk about uh, distribution of services, sharing leadership. Um, ultimately, that will take some cost uh, and expense uh, uh, out of uh, Mount Scutney. Um, but I think all of us are uh, wise enough and experienced enough to know that uh, just when when you when you bring places together, you, you never get the uh, uh, savings that you expect uh, on leadership and uh, managerial costs. But we we expect to see some over the next year to eighteen months. Um, I've mentioned our our uh, new service lines already, and then we're going to have both opportunities and risk 
uh, within the system. At some point in the next few years, we are going to go to uh, EPIC as a, as a medical record. That's uh, really one of the foundations of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. So that's gonna be both significant opportunity and, and uh, risk and cost uh, for us. We'll continue to lean heavily on DHH for things like supply chain, quality and safety, compliance work, and uh, you know the clinical benefits of of being able to uh, afford uh, a one day a week cardiologist as opposed to trying to hire a, a full time one and try to find business for them. Uh, you know we'd be dealing with that uh, for any extra service beyond primary care. So it it has been. Uh, great benefit to be in the system. And Dave, I think uh, I think you're bringing us home here. So uh, again, capital 2.5 million. Uh, there are no CONs, obviously, given the amount uh, in that, nor do we have any uh, scheduled for the next few years. Um, you know, kind of really mostly routine for us and and as i reference every year there's nothing sexy in our capital nothing exciting or interesting uh it's just replacement of rooftop units uh aging equipment and beds and 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 the like so um nothing really to talk about there um one of our issues next slide joe um is you know again we were historically underfunded for for many many years here i feel like when you walk around our facility, it looks good, it functions well, our equipment is good. Um, we're, we're offering um, pretty, pretty excellent services for a small hospital uh, and the providers are happy with the equipment that we're providing to them. So I feel like we've, we've gained a lot of ground uh, over uh, the last uh, seven or so years I've been here. Um, our biggest issue is is bandwidth, uh, throughput of, of those types of projects. Um, and, um, you know, and obviously we don't know, we've done a lot of COVID-19 related capital. We've changed uh, air exchange units in the OR so that we can turn cases faster and uh, uh, have a higher level of uh, uh, safety for uh, our providers and staff and, and patients. And so we've been a little bit strategic in how we manage the COVID-19 uh, capital. And, you know, we're really looking to, every time we do something, it's okay, great, we need to keep people safe. And then what opportunity do we have uh, to, to improve our ability to recover and regain volume that's been lost and make sure the people get the services that, that they need when they need them. Next slide. I think this is you, Joe. Yeah, um, there we we, did, we embedded the, the two initial questions from um, the healthcare advocate, and I, I think I saw uh, uh, Julia handling questions today, so we're ready ready for more after the presentation. Uh, but the question was, will would we be applying for the healthcare provider stabilization grant funding? And the answer was no, we feel like our recovery efforts are uh, proceeding uh, very well, as well as uh, further expense management over the remaining of, uh, remainder of this fiscal year and into the next one. Um, so we feel like we're, we're not gonna have a significant hole to fill when, when all the dust is settled over the next half year. Uh, and again, we, we weren't uh, comfortable at the time to commit to our current One Care Vermont footprint, which uh, was going to be a requirement as well. Um, you know, how much weight was going to be put on that, we weren't sure, but uh, either way, uh, those were the two compelling reasons why we did not uh, apply for that funding. And uh, that's it, that's our presentation. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen. There, I think. Well, that was a great uh, final picture. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to start with uh, board member Holmes. Jessica. Great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the very clear presentation. Uh, also, I wanted to start by thanking you, uh, well, all of you at Mount Escutney, for the dedication clearly that was demonstrated, came through in the narrative of your staff dealing with COVID and all of the Herculean efforts. And, and really, it really came clear in that narrative and just a uh, 
a heartfelt thank you for that. Uh, it's a crisis unprecedented. We don't know how we're going to deal with it. And it seems like you all really handled it well. So appreciate it. Um, I, maybe I'll start with some of that recent uh, last few slides um, and a little bit your conversation you talked about in the narrative about the work that the leadership team is doing with Springfield and Valley Regional to try and think about you know regional allocation of services. And you've also talked about in, in the presentation the integration with Dartmouth Hitchcock. And there have been recent conversations around the growing consolidation in Vermont of hospitals and affiliations. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could just talk briefly about what would the but for world be if Mount Escutney was a standalone independent hospital in this particular time? And, and what is your perspective on affiliation and consolidation just in general? It seems like you're moving in these directions with increased in integration, increased affiliations, shared services. Must be a reason for that. So can yeah. you talk about that? So, uh, you know, Dave mentioned uh, the dark days uh, before uh, he and I and, a, and some of the other senior leaders arrived. Um, so our decision back in 2013 and then finally ratified in 14 uh, to enter the DHH was uh, was really an existential one. Uh, and we needed the security of being part of a larger system. We also knew that we had resources that Dartmouth Hitchcock wanted. I, I think I've mentioned before, I was on the DH bench when we started affiliation talks and finished on the Escutney bench. And, and there was a, a pretty good match of what DH wanted and what we could provide. Um, and it's that that match, that that match in, in resource need is not always there. So I I, I hate to project our experience uh, as uh, the, the right one for everyone. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to, to present to the Green Mountain Care Board. This might be my fifth one. Uh, and uh, it was a lot bumpier in the beginning because service lines were changed. Uh, we lost, we quote, lost orthopedics, ears, nose, and throat. Um, they went back to DH in, in times of, of crisis because they had a departure of physicians. And that hurt. And that took, a, it took a lot of management and staying on message that affiliation is good, integration is good, um, despite these bumps and bruises. Um, and we still have those bumps and bruises. It's less on the, far less on the clinical side now, more so on uh, certain administrative projects. Uh, we still sometimes deal with the, well, have your people work with our people, and our people is me and Dave and Teresa, and uh, it's, we, we don't have a, a deep bench to do some of the work. Um, but so I would say for us, being part of a larger health system has been uh, net positive and more net positive every every year. Um, and so our, you know, we 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 started work over the last ten months with uh, Springfield and Valley. The the work with Valley Regional predated the work with Springfield, uh, but Springfield had kind of jumped to the head of the line due to its entry into bankruptcy and and. Uh, we, we spent a significant amount of time, myself, Dave, folks from Valley, uh, Alan, Mike, who just finished their presentation, um, uh, but ultimately didn't get to a point where uh, uh, folks could agree on terms of, uh, you know, entering Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health, what that would mean organizationally, administratively, from a leadership perspective. Um, so the work with Valley is ongoing. That's still going to happen. We're you know, we're 18 minutes from Valley Regional in a, in a in, in two remarkably different environments between Vermont and New Hampshire, certainly. Um, uh, but I think a lot of potential there. And, I, and I, I, I do think we'll continue to work with Springfield as we move forward. But I'd be dishonest to say if I didn't say, you know, we took our foot off the gas uh, in, in Springfield because of uh, uh, just the, the, the way the uh, the working groups kind of ended. Okay. Can I add on to that, Jessica? Is that okay? Sure. So I, I think one of the things that we're we talk about how rational we're going to allocate services and staff, and you know we've already been tinkering with this, you know, contractually with them on a case by case basis. But um, you know, no CAH can really, in theory, ever be a hundred percent efficient. 
you know, the, we, we, we can't hire a 0.3 respiratory therapist. You know, you can't, we just can't make it fit volume versus FTE. And we manage to that every month. I mean, we measure that constantly. And so we find, well, you know, there's a run in speech therapy right now. And we really need 1.2, not just one. And so we've been able to contract with Valley, uh, who's really running at 0.8. And so they send over their speech therapist every Friday to manage some of the outpatient volume. So our, our person, you know, is not hair on fire uh, week after week, and uh, they're offsetting some costs. So um, we just brought in a traveler respiratory therapist for COVID due to some uh, issues that were going on. I don't know what's going on there with us, if I'm the only one seeing that. Maybe, I don't see anything. So, yeah, there's some kind of weird outlook thing going on there. Um, so, um, but, you know, I we felt like we were a little skinny if this thing got uh, really out of hand and we started taking more patients than we ended up taking. So, you know, I called Valley and, and we split the traveler. And, and so there's just spent a lot of those types of things uh, and then looking at, well, you know, do we all need to have a one day a week oncology service? What if we had the oncology clinic centralized, but did the infusion in, in community specific locations? And, and we're seeing there's not only a financial benefit, but there's a, a deeper bench. You know, we had an ultrasound tech um, who had a personal issue and had to leave for a week. We had no ultrasound for inpatient, outpatient, we're done. We're done for a week. Got to shuffle 40 patients out. Uh, and what we were able to do was contact Valley and uh, and executed a, 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 a rental staff sharing contract uh, and uh, um, uh, to, to take care of the patient need here and push off the non-urgents, but keep the urgent, emergent, inpatient people taken care of. So those are the things that, that are gonna make a difference to the patients, but also financially. Yeah, and all of that makes a lot of sense to me. I appreciate all that hard work you're doing. Um, a question about your volume assumptions. I just want to understand, you know, every hospital is so different and, and, and partly because we don't really know what's happening with COVID. Understandable, so much uncertainty. So I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on what everybody is assuming. And I, my uh, my understanding now is that, so you're assuming 95% of normal values, 100% for emergent, urgent, and 90% for elective and preventative. Um, does that 95% of normal values um, I'm trying to figure out how that includes or doesn't include the additional providers in, you know, urology and psych and, and by the way, psych, I'm so thrilled that you've got two psychiatrists, so important, obviously, we're such a shortage there, so congratulations. Um, but I, I'm trying to, is it 95% of normal without those additional providers or 95% of normal now inclusive of those providers? So my what, question, we, I'm not sure if I'm clear on my yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 you know ninety five percent of normal, and then added neurology and okay. urology, and okay. there's a little so it's like a five percent effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. and so we just kind of normal we we renormalized and then added the two new services if that helps. That helps tremendously. Thank yeah. you. I wasn't sure if it was actually a larger COVID effect that was just overshadowed by the additional yeah. providers. Yeah, D and uh, Dave and I had. Uh, innumerable meetings around how what kind of volumes we thought we were going to to get to with the new practices with our existing practices you know our, our current recovery dashboard every week we do volume to budget what we ex what we expected and we're you know primary care is about 80 percent of what we ex uh, what we expected in a non-covid world our emergency room is 120 percent or 110 percent of, of a non-COVID world, our inpatient volumes right on budget, so that's that's really what triggered. Okay, let's let's just our emergent, urgent, inpatient business. That's all going to be the same. ED volume again has come back because I I think a lot of folks aren't coming back to clinic despite our efforts, and we're getting them in the ED unfortunately. Um, but primary care is um, is going to lag. There's still a good population of folks that don't want to come back and uh, and really don't like telehealth for, for whatever reason. They don't have Wi-Fi. I mean, I, I mean, I live in Norwich like Susan. I can't do a Zoom call from home because I've got 
you know, over the air Wi-Fi beamed from a mountaintop. It's yeah, so patients and providers just just uh, have not em embraced it after the initial when, when it was really necessary. Everyone got on board, but as it became less necessary, telehealth unfortunately has has dwindled. Um, with respect to the rate, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the effort you made to separate out, you know, the sort of the normal rate request and then the COVID specific rate request, um, recognizing that not all COVID expenses are going to be ongoing. So just not all hospitals did that, but I, I wanted to let you know I appreciated that effort. Um, I am trying to get a handle on medical inflation. I've been asking all the hospitals this question. Just what are the assumptions that hospitals are making about medical inflation? And I, I've been thinking about three buckets. So you've got your compensation bucket, wages, salaries, benefits, and then you've got medical supplies and you've got pharma. And those are the three that I've been focusing on. It sounds like uh, you're flat on wages and benefits for next year. So 0% price inflation there, although that would not be a normal uh, inflation, but for next year, that would be the expectation. And what percentage of your overall expenses are, would you say your compensation bundle is? Um, as a percent, I, so I kind of look at it uh, two ways because I overly complicate everything. But uh, if I'm if to I, really simple here, so don't don't get too complicated. <laughs> but if we look at labor, you know what that is defined as at Mount Scutney has changed as we've. We've contracted for management uh, from Dartmouth, and you know, so so if I look at it from a just the people we employ plus their all benefits, labor in there. it's okay, it's, all labor. It's six, yeah, it's sixty percent just for our actual employees and benefits. And if I look at total labor costs, it's more like 70, 72 percent somewhere around there. Perfect. Okay, and then what would you say is your assumption about medical supplies? growth, you know, the inflation rate on medical supplies? Well, I, I guess the, 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 you know, I always try to find those little advantages we have because we don't do a ton of surgery. Um, when you get into some of these surgical supplies, uh, you know, titanium implants and things like that, you, you have zero control over inflation. I mean, very little negotiation power. So because we do less of those things and more routine things, um, you know, I think our inflation on medical surgical supplies is actually fairly small. I would say, depending on the type of item, one, one to two and a half percent, somewhere in that range. Okay. And then pharma. What, so, and actually, what is the bucket size of medical supplies in general? If you had to guess. I'm sorry, though, the overall yeah, blended percentage of, of your expenses that are medical supplies. Uh, off top of my head, I'd have to do the math. I don't okay. know. I can certainly okay. get to you. No, that'd be perfect. And then pharmaceutical. I'm wondering what your expectation is on growth price inflation for pharmaceuticals. Well, the problem with pharmaceuticals is, is it's it's got two issues. You've got inflation, which uh, I would say is running three to five percent. Uh, and it changes quarterly because it's also a supply and demand issue. So when you talk about a, a med like IVIG or something like that, supply and demand come, that that price changes daily. It's like a it's like a commodities uh, discussion, yes. and and it's it's grossly unfair to everyone involved except maybe the people selling it. Um, but um, the other piece of it is, especially in the area of infusion, you know the best practice changes. So it's not even an inflation discussion. It's the new latest, greatest, shiny thing. And yeah. so we have to throw in a factor for that. And, sure. and, that, and that growth is run in three to 5% a year. Okay. From the and stuff pharmaceuticals is what percentage of your overall kind of budget, would you say? No, no, kind of roll them up internally. So I don't really think of them as separate. Okay. Okay. Get that. Yep. okay, that'd be great. Yep. Um, Okay, perfect. So uh, you assumed a 1% rate increase for Medicare. Is that because you're expecting a favorable Medicare cost report? Is that the, the tie in there? Yeah, just the way we we, we ran the uh, the 2019. Um, we didn't get a chance to run to 20. Uh, and we just kind of smoothed the difference through. Um, there's, you know, we've got uh, the uh, um, temporary 
canning of uh, sequestering. We've got a couple things like that in there, and that's yeah. kind of how it came. There's a there's a bit of movement in services. We had a higher, uh, we were experiencing higher acuity as a percentage of our business. So we used to be, you know, three acutes and uh, 15 swing beds, and now we're five acutes and uh, 11 or 12 swing beds. So it's it's there's a lot of levers there, Jessica. To be honest with you, I'm not trying to. Oh, I know. Yeah, I, I was trying to get a sense of it, um, but that, mm -hmm. I appreciate that it's multifaceted. Um, and then my, my I guess my last question, knowing that there's other people waiting, is just what is the rate assumption you're making on Medicaid? Well, uh, Medicaid, I think that's on the sh your sheet in front of you. Okay. Uh, and, and so as a percentage, uh, the reimbursement ratio, I think you folks call it, um, goes up 34%, uh, which is commensurate uh, or close to what we budgeted for 20. Unfortunately, our realized rate this year to date has been tanked by the borders, uh, and 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 uh, because the Medicaid's the primary payer, but we're not get we're getting, you know, 200 bucks a day on on you know a cost of you know 800 to 1,000. So, um, so that's kind of our assumption to kind of go back more north to the normal. Um, yeah, I guess I would use the reimbursement rate on a fee-for-service basis. Like, what would you expect their, like, you know, their overall average rate increase? Well, I think that's that's what your reimbursement rate is. There? Okay. I'll, I'll look at it again. Yeah, I think that's what it's calculating. So 34%, okay. and if you want to sit there and say, what's your cost? It's about 50 cents on the dollar is our cost. And so they're running, you know, whatever, two-thirds of cost. Okay, I will look at it. I won't take any more time. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. All. Thank you, Jess. Ne next is member Lunch. Robin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe and David. You actually anticipated a bunch of my questions, so I only have a couple. Um, on page 12 of your presentation, you talked a little bit about changing hours. Um, could you just give us a little bit more detail about what, what that was related to? I know it's COVID related, but. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So a couple things jump out. Uh, we use, used to provide um, uh, clinic hours in our Woodstock, Vermont clinic on Saturday mornings. Um, but because of issues with uh, door screening and the need for additional staff and the inability to get additional staff to work on those weekends, um, as well as the need to reallocate the providers that were working there in the weekends to at least for availability for inpatient service. So we brought those back and reduced those hours, uh, held those those clinic hours. Um, those will go back at some point after the dust settles. Um, you know, we also wanted to, in our recovery efforts, wanted to uh, push out for more uh, evening availability uh, for patients uh, uh, in our clinics here in Windsor. Um, we also had to add hours for what we're calling our swab and go process for uh, folks that need COVID testing, uh, but don't necessarily need a full evaluation. And th that group of people are our OR patients. Uh, we mm -hmm. are, are, are testing and need a negative before we bring them back to the OR, even though we're practicing the same standard of PPE, whether they had COVID or not. Um, but that was a response to, to state mandates around testing. So we had to ha stand up weekend hours uh, and availability on Saturdays and Sundays for, for COVID testing. Um, and, and Dave, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else around hours, but those are the big ones. Yeah, and then we've had, uh, you know, one of the big issues with the ancillary services is trying to decompress waiting rooms, yeah. right? And, and not have yeah. them so packed. So. Uh, I, I oversee lab and radiology and a couple other services. So we've expanded the hours that folks can make appointments. So we have fewer people in the waiting rooms. Uh, our rehab folks uh, have also been very creative in moving a space and, and reclaiming space as well as changing the schedules that they're available just to have fewer people coming through at the same time. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. Just to give a little sense of yeah. what that was about. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your traveler's costs? Uh, some of the hospitals we've been seeing like a, a pretty um, big-ish reduction in traveler's costs. So I was just curious what's going on there. 
it's a little harder with your budget because you do have the contracted services with Dartmouth, so it's hard to tease that out. Yeah, and and you know, I, I so I can give you the 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 overall kind of understanding, and and if you require anything else beyond that specifically, I'd I'd be happy to provide it because it does get. Uh, thrown into that contracted labor line. Um, but we've done very well year to year on that typically. Um, we're, we're struggling a bit now, and some of that is the wage or, you know, uh, recruitment and retention issues that Joe referenced. Um, that's one piece of it. Um, but the, the other piece of it is, I, I think, um, as our services have changed a bit, how we do things, the types of People, we've got an aging workforce retiring harder and harder to replace. Uh, there's just a lot of little factors, uh, and and again, we are a small end. So, you know, one traveler in here for the next two weeks is a big change in the percent of travelers. Um, and yeah. it's you know that's the way it's been working, unfortunately. But I'd be happy to break that out for you. Thank you. That'd be great. Um. Thanks for talking about the telehealth. That's an area that I've been interested in sort of learning more about how that's flowing through. It seems like there's quite a bit of variation around the state. Uh, so it was good to hear your experience there. Um, let's see. Oh, the other question I had was related to the loss of the blueprint funding. I was a little confused about that because, um, quite frankly, I sit on the blueprint executive committee and I haven't heard anything about it. Uh I can I can speak to that. I, I think we I think there's concern and uh, even concern at that the, the one care level again. What I'm in the middle of all these <laughs> different uh, groups, either hospital or one care or elsewhere, um, where I guess we haven't felt secure that there'll be the same amount of level funding in, in blueprint year to year, um, and as as the the funnel for blueprint funding has moved over uh, to the to the one care side, um, I know I personally have been waiting for a few years of when blueprint would be a, a carrot or a stick uh, to get people into uh, more folks uh, into one care or at least some of the programs um, because and, and tie it to blueprint funding. So we again, I think it's just that level of un uncertainty that we've had from year to year blueprint funding. And it, at every, it seems like every year the same thing happens, and we get level funding, and that's that's great. But there is a level of uncertainty um, that we face each each year when we think about it. And is that uncertainty on the like the Medicaid and commercial side? Because on the Medicare side. It comes through one care, but it is distributed to any provider regardless of participation, and that's not going to change. That's right, but a good chunk of blueprint funding is funded by shared savings. So yeah, if you don't have shared savings. Where does the funding come from? That's that's probably the that, yeah. that's the insider pool, which is no longer you know in the insider pool since we're we're uh, testifying publicly. But that's always the concern if if. If ACO performance isn't isn't as strong as we'd like it to be, then how how do we fund it? How do we fund blueprint? Right. Um, yeah. I I I think that there's some misunderstanding there because the benchmark is increased by that blueprint funding. So while it's technically out of shared savings, if it comes out of the program, it comes out of the benchmark. So it 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 would be a, I I know people. Uh, connect those because of the way the language works, but our current uh, ACO budget order wouldn't allow for any change in blueprint funding. So I, I get the uncertainty, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's a, a real uncertainty from a legal perspective. So I'll just put that out there. Um, uh, that, I think that's all my questions, unless I missed something. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Member Pelham, Tom? Well, Joe and David, welcome to my dining room. Um, <laughs> this this new era is something, I think. Um, so I just, uh, you know, in describing the pension, I, I think uh, the termination of, of, of the pension, I think you described it as a win-win-win. I didn't hear a loss in there anywhere. Um, and so that's probably true. But I'm just interested in this arrangement. I mean, I can see in terms of your non-operating money, you can see it in, in 2020 projection, you, you go to a 9% uh, 
you know, uh, total operating mar margin because of that. Uh, but who is carrying the actuarial risk associated with with uh, with with your your employees? So uh, when you terminate a pension, basically an insurance company for is the usual uh, uh, purchaser. Um, they say we will buy your risk for a hundred and I'm making up a number, but it's somewhere in this range, depending on market. Uh, we'll, we'll buy out your 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 risk and your liability for 110 cents uh, on the dollar. So if our if our total liability was 13 million dollars, uh, then we can get them to take that for 13 million dollars times 1.1, and they take the the risk. Um, the the uh, pension recipients get to choose between a fixed annuity solution. Uh, they can actually lump sum their way out and take their money and put it into uh, an investment or cash out altogether, taking the tax hit. But all, they've got three or four choices to make. Um, and so the more conservative you are, then you take the annuity and, and the guaranteed income. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're a little bit more of a risk taker, uh, you know you'll take the lump sum and reinvest it yourself in a in a vehicle and and avoid the tax hit. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, regarding the borders, I just want to make sure I understand this that you have seven to eight borders there, and there were some borders there when we visited and, and had our <laughs> meeting down there last year. Um, and uh, so what I'm understanding is, is that you don't get any met, any reimbursement associated with them as long as they're boarding in the hospital. But if you find an appropriate place for them, then you will get reimbursement or you will just uh, not have the expense of, of caring for them in, in the hospital. And, and so that $700,000 reserve you have, and I think, are, is that in 2021? We're talking That's, about the 20. <laughs> That's, that's running now, but we reduced it for 21. Okay. You uh, reduced it by 700,000. Correct. You're that's assuming why, no borders in 2021. Right. So that's why the Medicaid reimbursement improved as a percentage in 21 from current. Uh, and then to get to the prior part of your question. So, uh, you know, we often will get somebody who has Medicare, Medicaid. They come into our swing bed unit. They do their sniff level stay. Uh, we there's usually a delay in getting placement or appropriate discharge, so we're kind of used to people uh, moving into an uh, a intermediate care level of care, and uh, Vermont Medicaid uh, pays uh, will will pay a nursing home rate to us for 30 days to facilitate that discharge or placement to a nursing home or home or to get home health arranged. So we get like. I'm making up the number, but it's probably within three dollars. We get like two hundred and forty two dollars a day. So if, if you think about like just the nursing care. Two hundred forty two dollars a day is done. It's, you know, just for that regards of heat, lights, medication, food yep. and, and all the rest that comes to it. So we lose money every day they're here, even when we're getting paid by Medicaid. We do have some patients that actually are in the process of applying for Medicaid, so they actually have zero uh, insurance or zero ability to make payment of any kind to us. So that reserve is kind of like uh, what we're getting dinged for with Medicaid and what we're getting dinged for from a self-pay standpoint. Complicated. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm looking at your uh, your your. Uh, rate proposal, and I see that combined between the the basic rate increase and the COVID rate increase, uh, you're assuming sixty one thousand um, dollars in additional revenue, Medicaid revenue, off that rate increase. And I'm just wondering, uh, maybe it's similar to a question. I think I think that uh, Jess answers. What what is your assumption that uh, getting a rate increase will increase your Medicaid revenue? Uh, for for every point of increase, or yeah, yeah. either either way, for the the total two point two whatever it is, or each one percent, there's a there's a, an additional margin that you have on your 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 rate profile that says that your Medicaid amount will go up, and between the two, it's sixty one thousand um, bucks. Yeah, I, I, I let me just see what I've got here in front of yeah, me. Yeah, I'm not so concerned about the number. I'm just 
you know, what is the basis for assuming that you get more money, if, you know, through an increase in charge? Yeah, I think it's it's really just the 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 factoring of. I mean, we, you know, we grab a percentage, we study, determine the percentage, and then apply it against the gross revenue increase. And so I, I get your I get what you're asking, and I'm not sure I can answer it sitting here without ciphering a little bit. Okay. Uh, but I'd be I'd be happy to get back to. You. I I think I understand what you're asking. Um, well, in most of the charge rate. Uh, you have documents that we have as, as part of the budget process. When people are getting a rate increase, a charge increase, they don't attribute any uh, revenue coming in from Medicaid. And so, you know, that's why you stood out to me because you were attributing revenue uh, coming in associated with the charge increase from Medicaid. Yeah, I'm not sure why anybody else would have zero, um, mainly because we, you know, Medicaid does give us some form of inflation year to year. Occasionally, that is eaten away with with a DRG value reset or an APC reset or whatever. But um, generally, they give us a little something every year. So okay. that's where the 61 is coming from. But I'd have to go back and cipher the actual percentage that we anticipate. Okay. So, I mean, and, and we don't need to get into a discussion of why it's a negative number, but in your payer mix uh, proposal, you show that Medicaid is going down uh, relative to the 2020 budget um, by $325,000. And so my question is, um, if you're wrong and it goes the other way and you get uh, Medicaid revenues at $325,000, so you have this $650,000 swing, where would you put that money in your income statement well, and you know, what line item might you consider as a higher high, higher priority, or would you let it fall to the bottom line uh, to operating margin? Well, the only other place I can do would be to build reserves. Um, and so unless I felt like there was uh, a, a reserve that needed to be built, increased, or changed, uh, it, we would roll it. I mean, we have to go through audits, so all of our reserve levels have to be justifiable based on experience and documentation. So uh, to answer your question, if if we had a pickup from that, it would trickle down. And, I, and, and uh, Tom, just to add, I, I think, you know, our population, given what it is, it's really zero sum game. If we had our pair mix changes, it's coming, uh, it's coming out of something else. It's you know, we'll have less commercial business if we have more Medicaid business. I'm, I don't expect an influx of folks to our neck of the woods um, uh, that whose primary payer would be Medicaid, I would suspect it's folks who have lost their job uh, and are uh, hopefully getting on the exchange, but if not, moving to moving to Medicaid. That'll be the primary push and change in payer mix, I think, over the next probably six to 10 months. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for joining me in my dining room, and I'll turn you over to uh, uh, Maureen's office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm at my office here. Um, I just have a couple of questions. A lot of what was um, already asked, but um, first, thank you for the thorough presentation. Um, just want to touch base on where your cash position is going um, post the COVID relief, because it looks like on the cash flow statement that you provided, the 2020 projection is significantly improved, and some of that will come back off in 21. But it seems seems like you're coming out in a lot better place and just want to talk to that a little bit. Um, so I guess it's it's a kind of a three uh, three point answer. Uh, the first is, um, you know, we've tried to as best we can predict um, what funding we're going to be receiving and that we have received stimulus being the, the big five million dollar gain. Um, uh, initially, if, if we had presented our or submitted our budget at the beginning of July, like usual, uh, we would have had a, a less optimistic outlook on that, um, and uh, we had we would have had no real idea on our efforts to recover. And what really seems to be happening is we are we're we're managing the expenses, um, we are recovering quicker and better than I think we would have anticipated two months ago. Um, and so 
I think that we're going to be less tragic than we would have thought about uh, May or June uh, today. So uh, unless there's a, a really large surge or, or our our COVID, uh, um, you know, uh, exposure radically changes, I, I think that our current course, we changed our the cash flow and our, our balance sheet literally the day before we submitted because we went back and studied how how cash was working and our ar is growing back up appropriately because of revenue and uh we're liquidating we also worked down our ar as the third piece uh during this year so we're hoping to maintain it at that at that level because you did have in your 20 budget you had about 8.1 million estimated for cash 20 projection is 15.4 and your 20 21 budget is 10.6 because obviously that's returning some of the money that's owed that's probably in your cash flow but correct um and the reason is um that i'm kind of pressing on that issue is fortunately it seems like several of the hospitals the money that they received or are going to receive from covid um barring the npr reductions has has made their balance sheet stronger um, because of the cash that was received and you know you are looking as we had asked which i appreciate that you did separate out a request for covid for 2021 um and and i would just like to push back a little bit on whether there's a need for that in 2021 the incremental um 2.2 percent that you were requesting based on where you're ending up um at you know where you're projected to end up you know in covid on the balance sheet side Right. And part of our gain in cash is, you know, our underspending of capital. And so, as we mentioned in our presentation, you know, not doing all the capital that we had planned does provide us some risk to deal with. And when I look at it internally, because, you know, our stuff doesn't always fit nicely with your stuff, um, you know, we're looking at we're down $2.7 million from last fiscal year end. And that's likely where we're going to finish up. So we're down, we're down, we're going to be down 10, 10 or so days. And, and then, you know, boy, I've got this risk of capital. So our thought with the 2% COVID was let's split that, you know, not even necessarily in half because every percentage points worth about, you know, $450,000. So two points is worth 900, 2.2 is worth nine and change. So uh, we're not looking to make up $2.7 million. We're looking to make up, you know, roughly 900 to a million uh, as security going forward. Okay. And um, my, my biggest concern is your NPR projection and where you think you're going to net out for 2021. And just looking at some of the numbers and some of the discussion that we've had, your year to date through February was tracking seven and a half percent, seven point four percent down on NPR. Um, actual compared to 2019, it was projecting 2.5 percent down. Um, you've talked about believing you'll be running about 95 percent, and I'm not sure whether that's 95 percent of the trend that was seven, you know, where you were already down or that you were considering that. Um, and then adding in the incremental that you'll get from some some of the new services as well as the commercial as well as all the rate increases you had. And I think there was about a million for each of those. So you, know, you might be getting plus two million for your rate increases that you've put in and for the incremental services. Um, having a hard time getting up to the 55 million that you're projecting. Um, as you were in 2019, I'm sorry, 56 million, you were at 50.8 million, your budget was 53.8 million. And if you look at where you were trending, you would be trending down towards, uh, I think about 48 million, uh, no, sorry, 49.6 million if I take the, where you were trending uh, pre-COVID. And so, you know, again, it's really just trying to, to push back on you guys about what your numbers are there, because again, you you know you end up building your expense base on there, and I would hate to see you end the year 
um, around a 52 or 51 million, which would still be an uh, increase over the prior years, but down three or four million dollars. So I, I think, you know, you've you've tended to, and I know maybe it's just in your explanation, but you know, when you explain part of your NPR, part of the part of it was also, you know, we have a budget, you give us a three and a half percent cap. And then we added the incremental on top of the three and a half percent cap that were allowed. We added the incremental COVID number, and that's why we're coming up at this five percent rate. And I know you also are building it from the bottom up, but I get concerned when it seems like we're just taking the budget, the three and a half, and the COVID, and we come to a number. And yes, you're you would be allowed to be at that number, if you will. But my concern isn't whether you're allowed to be there or not, it's whether you'll actually get there. So, you know, at the end of the day, with the commercial rates you have in here, assume that goes through, you know, will you really be at 55? So that, that's where really my biggest concern about you being able to hit these numbers. And I guess one of the questions to support that would be, you know, where are you trending now? in July and August, September, as you track those months, you know, you'll, you'll be able to get a better read on where it's going to be. So it's nothing about what you're doing or what's in there. It's just really saying because of COVID and if you only come in at 95% and you were tracking behind, you know, adding some of the incremental things you will get, I don't get to 55 or 50, actually 56, right? I, I think there's, so there's a lot in there, um, yeah. a lot to unpack. So. Um, and I'm happy to have an offline, but I'll give you a, a couple quick responses. Uh, the biggest gain um, is that we're not going to be booking risk. Okay. okay. Um, and and so that that's a huge chunk. Um, our settlement for 19, uh, you know, really our, the cost to play uh, last year was uh, really we just got those settlement numbers just recently, is is about 1.5 million. Um, so 1.5 million is in your 2020 forecast, if you will, right. and was what was in 2019? Was it about that as well? It, it was about that. It was, it was maybe uh, 1.3. You know, I'd have to go back and look. But yeah. bottom line is, we're that come that that changes net. So. Yeah. Uh, Even though I hate it, changes net. That was always, <laughs> you know, I've always been against that going well, in net yeah. because of this very reason, but. Yeah, yeah, so so that's that's the big contributor to that change, um, and then uh, the 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 other one is, you know, we have greater confidence because we were at least able to get that 19 cost report done, to kind of reset our instrumentation because we had been kind of flying blind for 18 months or so, and and so we weren't gonna I'm not gonna take a lot of risk flying blind. So now that we had a little bit better information, not perfect but better. Um, you know, we could really go back and look at what's the impact with Medicare. Um, and in our cost per unit uh, for Medicare patients actually did go up significantly in 19, uh, mainly just because of the, the, the payer mix by service and, and whatnot. Not so much our actual costs went up, but how it got dis, uh, uh, assigned to Medicare changed. And so um, those are really the, the two big factors. And, and and I share your concern that, boy, you'd hate to see us not make it. Well, guess who also would hate to see us not make it. Um, but uh, I feel reasonably confident, uh, or I wouldn't have presented it, to be quite frank. I would have painted an uglier picture and asked you for more. Okay. So, yeah, I, and, more, and I'll add on to, you know, what May, June, and July have looked like from a recovery standpoint. Um, in, in May, essentially on budget, because we uh, uh, use some of our stimulus funds, uh, June and July on or ahead of budget without the need to use any of the stimulus funds. Um, it, it's not something to pat ourselves on the back on, but when, when you don't make much money, you don't lose much money. I, I didn't have to shut down three orthopods for two months. We, don't, we didn't have that. Um, the people that needed got that had surgeries, needed surgeries. Um, so uh, while we certainly dug a hole, five to $7 million hole due to COVID, um, we were uh, still able to recover again pretty pretty quickly. And, and um, I suspect August will look similar to July, which so it's been pretty speedy recovery. 
but we get back to the uncertainty of what the fall brings. Um, and uh, I, I share your concern about the numbers. Uh, Dave and I went back and forth for weeks um, and 95% recovery still seems optimistic to me, um, knowing uh, what we're doing in primary care and how that serves as the engine for the rest of what we do. Um, but uh, our experience thus far in our current community state, um, as far as recovery goes, has been strong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, time will tell, right? So hope, hopefully it will come out that way, but yeah. Um, all right, that's all the questions I have, thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Um, how many full-time uh, employees do you have, the equivalents? About 320. Yeah. And talk us through your thinking on PPP. Uh, so we don't was, qualify uh, because we're uh, the, we're in a controlled group, which is the Dartmouth Hitchcock Health uh, system, and uh, we actually went and got a legal opinion uh, because the regs were unclear. Um, I read them two or three times and said, "Well, this one kind of indicates we still qualify because we're small enough." Uh, but when they they took the controlled group uh, look at it, which we are part of the control group, Dartmouth has, is far too large, and their uh, number of FTEs are far too great for us to qualify. So we were precluded from even applying. Okay, and walk us through um, the seeming inconsistency and in the statements that were made in your presentation that. You didn't think, um, given the amount of uh, dollars that uh, came in, that you would qualify for the AHS uh, CRF funds, um, but then you've built in a component of your rate for um, taking care of uh, COVID-related losses. So how, how do you justify those two statements? Are you talking about the, the, um, the Vermont stabilization funds? Yes, the CRF. Yeah, funds. we we were told that there were uh, that the, the, well there are a number of criteria to consider it at the front end, and the first was need. Do you need the money? And we we just heard Maureen say, "Gee, I don't know if you need money," um, uh, and and we're recovering well, so I don't think that we pass a straight face test with that. Um, and then the other piece was One Care Vermont uh, participation. So that was also our understanding at the time uh, this, these materials were distributed for our consideration. Okay, it, it just uh, almost seems like uh, you're trying to put it on the back of commercial ratepayers versus accessing the, the funds that uh, are on the table, but you know that's just my perception of it. I, I'm very fearful that the hospital systems in Vermont are not going to access uh, enough of the dollars, so that dollars are going to be left on the table there, and will be used elsewhere. And in the meantime, um, Vermont ratepayers will will be paying more. But that's my thought on the issue. Yeah. So, uh, Kevin, I I think there the you know the requirements to to get it as initially outlined are uh, definitely uh, coloring the decision making process for the hospitals that are saying saying no if it was purely a this is the this is the deficit uh, caused by covid-19 and we'll one to one match it with the financials that we've um, that we share I, I think it would have been a no no brainer everyone's and everyone's balance sheet would look significantly better, but it's the, um, you know, it, it, it's what rode along with the the dollars that have have scared some of us. Um, that we're we're we have uncertainty around our our one care engagement in in, in 21, and um, you know we we may have missed the first cutoff of the 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 Vermont stabilization funds, but there'll be there will be, I think, another uh, crack at it. Um, but I've got to, I've got to navigate our hospital through the next month, a little less than a month, uh, with discussions around uh, around One Care before we would uh, then 
potentially even require significant reworking uh, of our budget, depending on the outcome of those discussions with our board in Dartmouth Hitchcock. So we, we outside of the uncertainty of COVID, there's, there's still a lot of balls in the air before we'd say, no, we're just not going to uh, uh, try to take advantage of those, uh, the funds available to us. And to be honest with you, Joe, that's another troubling aspect as I sit here listening that one of the founders of this organization um, is your affiliated entity, and yet you're you seem to be walking away from it, and uh, it, it just uh, it's perplexing. Well, uh, we we haven't had a great experience um, in in one care. Um, there have been a number of issues and, and challenges that we've had from the beginning at Mount at Mount Escutney. and uh, DHH. Uh, you know, my my boss, ha, you know, I, I was uh, has been very forceful in uh, pushing us to stay in all three programs, um, and but I have to navigate both that and my board, who actually gets to review our experience financially in, in, in one care. And our board asks great questions. My board chair is a, is a retired auditor. So nothing, nothing gets by him. Uh, and it, it, it you know, I, I'd, I'd be uh, violating my oath if I didn't say that if I said we had a good, a good experience um, in the ACO thus far. And I'm trying to balance, you know, I had a discussion with a reporter last week and she, uh, she brought up the same issue that you did um, and called me on it. And I said, you know, I, I, I wear I wear a lot of hats. I've, uh, as a practicing physician, I believe uh, that we need to change the way we deliver and finance healthcare. As a one care board, uh, being a, a, a one the board of managers of One Care Vermont, I believe that we are are trying to do the right thing and that this can be a vehicle for change, you know. But as the CEO of a hospital with, you know, 400 or so employees in total, the largest engine uh, 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 in our community, I've, I have got fiduciary duty to the hospital and to my employees to make sure that that we're doing everything we can to be sustainable. Um, and we've had a significant amount of growing pains locally. Uh, I just maybe our experience is unique, but it's it it's been a rough road. OK, thanks, Joe. Yep. Now turn it over to the healthcare advocate. Kevin, can I just ask a quick follow up question to that? Yes, go ahead. Is that OK? So, Joe, I'm just wondering, and this is a question I've asked at least one or another hospital. I'm trying to remember to ask more hospitals, but it's with respect to you said, you know, um, trying to think about how we change how we finance healthcare and also how we deliver healthcare. And, you know, payment reform happened first to some degree. I'm wondering if delivery reform has run in parallel with payment reform. And so some of the growing pains that maybe, you know, some hospitals are experiencing maybe a lag in the delivery reform. So I'm wondering if, uh, if, if, if a random physician in your, you know, organization were asked, how have you changed your delivery practice since the organization joined the ACO, what would they say? Yeah, I how think they would, they, they would say they have access to better data. At the same time, they would say they're drowning in data and drowning in clerical work um, uh, to check boxes and, uh, uh, struggle to meet the demands of of uh, an EMR, despite us having a pretty mature one for over the last eight years. Um, uh, hopefully, they would notice the increase in support staff around nursing, the work of the community health teams. Um, uh, but it's beyond those two things: data and uh, improved care management, which I think we have seen. Um, now, we don't know if that's changed outcomes significantly, but we we do know where the resources have been placed. I think that's what you'd, you know, I think that's what you'd hear. But would, you, would, would they say, hey, because of the data, I've changed how I'm delivering care, I'm ordering different types of tests, I'm bringing people in who haven't been in for a while. I mean, is the data yes. actually providing? Yep. 
Yeah, I, I would I would say yes, yeah. affirmative to those two things. Um, uh, that we have had better, as I said, better care management of our uh, more complex patients, um, and we have changed practices in our clinic, specifically specifically around the care of our patients with uh, COPD. Um, that's been a real bright spot, and you can see the data very clearly on one care of what. COPD admissions used to look like and what they look like now with a marked uh, decrease. Um, you know, some of our, um, we, I'm very cognizant of layering on more ad, ad, administrative burden uh, on our providers. And we often will have our nurses run interference and do the patient registries and build the dynamic work lists that tell us about how all our diabetics are doing, how our COPD patients are doing, our heart failure patients are doing. Um, so I would say that providers have more tools, but I'm not sure that it takes away the overwhelming sense of the burden of working inside of uh, EMRs. I mean, we know what what a driver of provider burnout um, that is, the, 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 the drowning in data and the need to do all the, the clerical work with it. Unfortunately, data your 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 data going coming out is only as good as the data going in. So um, there is uh, it can be challenging for for folks. I would agree with you that delivery changes has la have lagged behind payment changes. I I think we see that in in most ACOs. <laughs> yeah, I think the data coming out is only as good as how much you use it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Julia. Sure, yeah, I just have a few follow-up questions. Um, so first, I wanted to um, just ask for some additional clarification, and I apologize if I missed this elsewhere, just on the interaction between ACO participation and the Vermont COVID funding. I'm not clear on what that requirement is that you're not meeting. So we are currently, uh, for both 19 to 20. For 20, we're in all, all three programs in the ACO, Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. And uh, as part of the Vermont Stabilization Funds, uh, I, I believe this is the case, and if I'm wrong, if I, if someone please correct me, you had to maintain your current footprint in, in one care in 2021 to receive those funds. And we, at this point, have have not committed to anything beyond Medicaid uh, in the ACO for 2021. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. Um, and then second, I'm wondering if you can just give us a little more clarity on um, where your board members or where your concern is lying with the ACO. Is it the target or the risk quarter or generally the just taking risk in general that's causing yeah, problems? I think, um, I think initially uh, we were most concerned around downside risk in a, in a time of great uncertainty. Um, our risk uh, quarters have increased uh, each year. Um, if we're talking about a million and a half of downside risk in Medicare in, for a hospital that has a 0.6% operating margin, that's about 300 grand. Um, you know that it's it's five times our, our margin. Um, so that 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 has always been a concern from the start, and we've been very conservative around how we reserve for risk. Uh, probably probably more conservative than we needed to be, but now we've got the pandemic on top of that. Um, we uh, have there have been issues along the way. Um, that we have struggled to resolve, uh, whether it be at the CMS or CMMI level, um, that have led to what Dave referred to earlier in our discussion as flying blind. The inability to get accurate cost reports uh, really affects how, it, which is you know the foundational, the foundational data of everything we do is the, the the cost report, and having to fly blind for a significant amount of time also also hurt, and. You know, out, even outside of the downside risk corridor, there are there are significant costs to 
uh, providers to engage in the ACO. And again, in a time of uncertainty, we did not feel comfortable. And I know our board did not feel comfortable in committing to all three programs for the upcoming year. And I, again, freely free, will freely admit that that is uh, not what Dartmouth wants us to do. So I've got to navigate that with leadership at DHH, my board leadership, and then internally. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to 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 share with uh, board members and healthcare advocate. You know, our our running tally of of what our experiences uh, has been financially and otherwise. Um, and uh, we, we can we can do that after the presentation. We've we've, we've got all the data because we're preparing it for our board. That would be great, thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Thank you, Julia. At this time, we're gonna open it up for public comment on the Montescutney budget. Is there any public comment? Question. Dale. They mentioned that they had seen 50 COVID cases. And in fact, they were they were one of the first places to actually have COVID show up. I think Bennington area was the first one, but the Upper Valley was next to Burlington, one of the first. Um, that's a significant number of cases to deal with. What is their impression from that experience with schools opening up? What do they think? feel, especially being in the Upper Valley area, is I'd, I'd just like to hear what they're thinking the fall is going to look like. Yeah, Dale, that's a great question. So the majority of those cases really were early on, and the majority of those cases were also asymptomatic um, carriage. We've only had a handful of COVID positive inpatients uh, and post-acute patients uh, in the hospital. Our community prevalence has remained uh, very low uh, uh, for COVID-19. Um, and I think overall Windsor County cases have leveled off total number of cases around, you know, 70, 75 ish, uh, according to the last uh, dashboard. I can speak from the Dartmouth Hitchcock standpoint, their daily dashboard, there are currently three hospitalized patients with COVID-19 within our health system, two at DH and one with us. And ours was a, a patient that probably received it and during a, uh, in the community before getting admitted to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and then uh, coming our way. Um, so it, the, the risk still remains incredibly low. Uh, over the last couple months in our respiratory clinic, there've probably been a handful of positives uh, at the most and as I said, our employees have remained uh, COVID free. I think that if any region of the country can open schools, it's this one. Um, my wife is a school nurse in Hanover and uh, know the work that's going on in the task forces up in Hanover and know what we're doing uh, down here in Windsor. Um, and there are, you know, there are different plans in place at each district. Um, I also think that best practices will come to the surface very quickly as schools reopen. Um, and uh, within a month, we'll have a lot of clarity on how uh, learning should progress for our students, whether it's remote or in person. Um, it's not going to take long for us to know what's working, what's not, and what's safe. Um, but again, I, I'm for uh, school opening, and that's not just because I've got a one in high school and one in college. Um, I, I think, again, if anyone can do it, we can do it with with the right planning. Um, and I, I'm confident that our our surrounding school districts have have done that. But that that's a great question and a and a real concern. Okay, thank you. Other public comment. If not, um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dave. 